episode 330, How to Establish Systems in Your Coffee Shop. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. I'm very pleased that you decided to join me on the show today. And I would encourage you to subscribe to the show, especially because we put out a lot of episodes every month. Love for you to be up to date on those. So just go ahead and hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And also a great way to help the show is to share it with a friend. Share with them that there's this podcast that helps coffee professionals and coffee retailers and entrepreneurs really be successful in their endeavors, in their careers. Uh, There's so much in the uh, Keys to the Shop podcast that can help people with the great experts that we bring in from across industries, really. Diving deep into topics that are relevant to your coffee journey, there is just a lot of content that I think could be really helpful for people that you know. So you send them a link to Keys to the Shop, share a specific episode, but that really helps uh, get the word out about Keys to the Shop. And I thank you so much to all of you who have uh, done that and even shared these episodes with your team. I know of several coffee shops that uh, make a regular habit of listening to Keys to the Shop with their management team. And that's really huge and, and humbling. So a big thanks to you. And uh, I want to let you know that Keys to the Shop, on top of doing this podcast, also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. So that means whether you are already an operator of a coffee bar, but you want to level up your quality or you have some problems you need solved, um, you need uh, some training for your staff or workshops for your management, anything related to just making your coffee bar more excellent in its operations, quality, and people. There's a lot that Keys to the Shop can do to help you with that, as well as those of you who are just starting out in your coffee journey, and you need a trusted advisor to come alongside of you and help you through the process from concept to opening day. Keys to the Shop Consulting does that as well. So I would love to have a conversation with you if that sounds interesting and talk more about what the possibilities are. To get on a free discovery call with me for Keys to the Shop Consulting, just email chris at keystotheshop.com. Well, you know what is really exciting about coffee? It's innovation. And one of the most innovative developments in coffee that's come around in a long time is the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. This brewer, first of all, it's really an art piece. It's it's one design award. It's a fantastic conversation piece. But more than that, this actually levels up the quality of your batch brew coffee because the SCA award-winning technology gives you access to flavors and a precision over the extraction of those flavors like you've never had in a batch brewer before. Anyone who's got this in their shop is experiencing a new level of quality and control over the experience their customers have with their coffee. And it's not only leveling up batch brew coffee, it's also a workhorse and very versatile in that it creates tea, batched iced lattes, batch cold brew. So this thing brings efficiency, innovation, uh, next level quality, and it's something that I think you should explore for your coffee shop or for your next shop as you expand. To find out more information, go visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee. I love the people at Ground Control. I love what they're doing, and I think you will too. Again, go find out more information over at groundcontrol.coffee. Now, speaking of companies that are setting a standard for coffee, the Pacific Barista Series is exactly such a product. Uh, It is the line of plant-based performance beverages that are the standard for quality of plant-based cappuccinos, lattes, whatever you're making all over the world because every beverage in the barista series lineup is painstakingly created with the barista in mind and with a lot of feedback from world-class baristas and that means performance that's why it's called a performance beverage because when it gets on your bar it's going to create amazing texture for latte art It stands up to the heat from steaming, and the balance of the beverage remains focused on the coffee while delivering a consistently amazing quality experience to your guests. So if you're serious about serving great plant-based beverages in your shop, then I highly recommend you check out the Barista Series from Pacific. Go check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com. Again, if you're looking to serve the best in your shop, then I think it has to be the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today we are going to be talking about systems. We've talked about this before on the show. 
in reference to SOPs and checklists and things like that, I'm a big fan of creating systems because the kind of goodwill that we have toward our staff and our customers and everything else is not served well by just remaining quote unquote organic in our um, you know, day-to-day operations. A lot of coffee bars that I end up doing consulting with or uh, as people talk to me on the show, we'll talk about the early years that they grew and they grew organically, but then there was this moment where they realized there was so much going on, they need systems and they need processes and uh, some kind of way to uh, bring clarity to what's happening all around them because with all these different people and projects that inevitably grow from the establishment of a single coffee shop, there needs to be some kind of a a common goal and guide, and that's where systems come in. Uh, You know, they were going to talk about this a little bit later on, but it's helpful to mention it many times as a caveat. Systems are the servants of people. They're the servants of your values. You should definitely listen to the episode regarding uh, teaching your staff your company values. That was our last episode of Keys to the Shop. That will serve as a great like warm-up for today's conversation because in that episode, I, I mentioned planfulness, being somebody who is organized in the way that you pursue something that's noble. Your values are noble. Your mission is noble. You've, you've thought it through. You're really uh, energized by this, and so is everybody else. If you don't have systems in your shop that will uh, support the, um, the execution of that mission or the, or the um, pursuit of it, then it's unlikely to be successful. It's likely your attempts to make good on those things are going to be thwarted by unnecessary problems that crop up here and there. And you don't want to be a firefighter here. Uh, you don't want to have to constantly be chasing down problems that could be uh, solved simply by establishing a, a system around something that pops its head up one day, and then the next day we've got you know a policy about that, or we've got some clarity on that. I like to call this not wasting problems. So when problems come up, you don't want to just deal with them in a temporary way, um, or put a Band-Aid on it. You want to give it the time that it deserves because often what's on the outside is merely a symptom of something that's you know, it's not easily seen. It's, you got to be curious about why this thing happened and how it happened and how are we going to prevent ourselves from having to go through this same problem every single time. That's called wasting a problem because problems show us opportunities to improve unless we're just satisfied to just kind of push through the day and and not solve the deeper problems. And that's the way that I approach systems. So, um, you know, when I work with people, I will give them very basic templates or suggestions. Um, be, you know, sometimes when you buy templates for things like systems or checklists and other things, uh, it's very detailed and very filled out. I'm skeptical of those things because a lot of what makes something like this effective is that it's contextualized. And I have some doubts about our ability to discipline ourselves to contextualize something that's pretty much done for you, quote unquote. Um, we look at it and we're stressed out and we're just like, oh, this looks good. Let's just try to plug this in and then we'll, we'll fix it as we go. And usually what happens is we don't touch it again. We, we wonder why things aren't working and we've tried to apply a universal solution to a specific thing that requires nuance. So there's no getting around it, creating systems, whereas you might start with a philosophy, which is what we're going to talk about today. You can't get something ready-made that's going to fit exactly your situation. And we have to be disciplined in not allowing ourselves to feel a sense of relief that we've got this uh, template or this format or, you know, whatever it is, because we have to be students of our environment. And when we allow ourselves to feel this sense of relief as if the work is done, we rob this process of the specific nuances that make it effective. So those are a few uh, caveats that I want to throw out there just as we go forward that we're thinking about this the right way. It's a lot like when you say, oh, I'm going to follow the rules of 
you know, um, you know, a famous rich person, like what do they do every day? What do they eat for breakfast? How often do they work out? What books do they read? And if I do those things, I'll be rich and famous too. Not really. <laughs> you know, those things are uh, things that, yes, are attached to them. There are things that they do, but they don't necessarily tell the whole story. So as we go forward, realize that the missing piece in making this all effective is due diligence, awareness of your situation, contextualization, and bringing your specific nuance to the process. So let's talk about this. Let's get, let's get into the meat of our, our conversation today. You know, it's not any surprise that when people work in coffee shops and people go to coffee shops, one of the things that they experience a lot is confusion. Um, there's a lot of inconsistency. Uh, that inconsistency in experience does lead to confusion. So sometimes the table's clean, sometimes the table's not clean, sometimes the barista's nice, sometimes they're not nice, and sometimes the coffee's great, and other times it's not so great. And so it's like a logic game that you're playing. Uh, like what day, what's the algorithm of this coffee shop's best day, worst day, and how do I hack the system. That's what a customer is actually playing a lot of times when they're selecting things on the menu. It's based around this known inconsistency that they accept as a part of a you know coffee shop experience, but it does lead to this kind of frustration and confusion because you know, this is you know imperfect, you know, every system is imperfect and we can't expect perfection, but we can mitigate needless um, confusion and inconsistency through systems. But without them, we just kind of let inconsistency and confusion be the baseline by which people judge us. And then they're surprised when things go right. Uh, that's kind of the reverse of what we want, right? So uh, that confusion brings needless amounts of stress. There's a lot of doubt and uncertainty. And when we let those things fester, we lose staff, we lose customers, we lose our businesses. And then what happens is, because we were not operating with awareness to all of these little nuances that kind of ganged up and snowballed into something bigger, we're going to blame fate, we're going to blame the market, we're going to blame staff, for, we're going to blame anything except the thing that we can't see. Why would you blame the thing that you don't even know is there, right? And that's the tragedy of, of coffee shops is a lot of us enter into the industry with a lot of bluster, a lot of ego, a lot of confidence, not a lot of discipline, forethought planning. It's a rush to get the thing open. We're jazzed, we're branded, but we're not rooted, we're not planted, and we're not focused. And we definitely are rushing our, our systems or not even putting them in place properly. So the state of our shops basically follows the timeline of inconsistency leads to confusion, needless stress, doubt and uncertainty, and then just a loss of everything eventually. So obviously we don't want that. And there's solutions that systems can provide. Uh, a system would be defined as something like a process that produces a consistent result. That's it. It's a process. It's written down. It is communicated clearly. And it's a living document that supports the life of the business. You know, we have certain schedules and rhythms that we have in our lives, like drinking and eating and sleeping and other things that support our lives. And a business as an organism needs to have systems and inputs and outputs and things like that that help to support that life. Uh, they benefit everybody, systems do. Staff, leadership, customers. And honestly, customers think that you have a plan. You know, like they, You have it all together. When you open your doors, you've branded especially well and marketed well, they open. There's no reason for them, except for past experience, uh, like I talked about, to think that uh, you know you don't have it all together in a sense. Because why would you open a business if you didn't? So systems serve to back up that assumption. Hey, we do have a system. We have thought through what would happen when the doors open. We've thought through um, not just the projections of what we want to make after two or three months or six months or a year, etc., on our financial forecasting and our business plan, but we've forecasted the customer experience. We've forecasted you know, what we're going to need for staff and how we're going to care for our staff. There's a whole slew of things that need to be forecasted and planned for uh, through systems. And when you do that well, you create an impact of absence. And we, we have a shift break on this where the white noise of disappointing experiences is removed and the customer can't put their finger on it, but they understand 
wow, something is different about this place. And it's because you've gone through the trouble of digging way deeper than other entrepreneurs have and other operators have, and you've removed the unnecessary things, uh, the unnecessary frustrations and incongruities, and you've actually developed systems that maintain that standard. Instead of just getting lucky one day and having a really great coffee experience at a coffee shop, now I will, as a customer, feel confident that uh, when I go there, they're going to be, you know, on top of it because they always are. And now that's my new expectation. So this brings consistency, clarity, peace of mind, increased morale, insert positive thing here, you know, really, for um, your coffee shop. Now, um, there are a lot of different types of systems and uh, SOPs and checklists. Those are different kinds of systems. Really, it breaks down to about six different areas. There's cafe maintenance. So things that you need to do to take care of the physical space as people interact with it, your baristas, your customers, um, so forth. Um, quality control of what you serve to the customers from bagels to coffee to sandwiches, espresso and Italian sodas or whatever it is. Quality control is a huge thing that is uh, has to be backed up by systems. Communication as a lifeline of clarity and resourcing certainly needs systems. Uh, machine maintenance is another thing for the tools that you use in the space. Hospitality is the fifth category. So systems that will guarantee a great experience that is uh, a guest will know that you have a particular goal in mind with relation to hospitality. Um, and then finally, onboarding and training. Those are six of, you know, there's other categories I could write down here, but if I was going to choose six things that you needed to focus on, it would be those to start out because those are the ones that I see lacking the most in coffee shops all over the world. So now we're going to get into the systems creation process. That process follows a particular series of steps. There's observing, there's prioritization, then we're going to write the system or the process, and we're going to institute what we do. We're going to launch it. And then finally, we're going to come back and refine it. So you could probably guess how that would look, but I'm going to explain each of those steps here um, as we explore creating systems in your coffee shop. Now, another philosophy that I didn't mention in the beginning is systems are a love language. And I, I've said this on another show probably, but the systems as care is a concept that we need to embrace. You can express care through, you know, emojis, high fives, um, you're killing it, uh, whatever <laughs> you say to your baristas as you're passing by the espresso machine. But the proof of your care to people comes out in the operational reality of the business. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what your manual says. All that stuff is fine and dandy. But you have to back it up with institutionalizing thing, those, those values uh, through systems. That's a, how you show people that you care. It's how you show your customers you care. So let's talk about the first step here, observation. The first step in observing is that you actually have to be there in the cafe. Um, you know, a lot of times it's easy to just say, well, I don't want to actually be in the cafe. I want to hire people to run it for me. Well, honestly, if that's the type of attitude we have right from the beginning, that's how I turn down consulting clients, honestly. Like people who have the idea that I just want to, I don't want to run it necessarily or be involved in it. I just want to hire the talent and be a silent owner. To me, that as a barista for so many years and as a manager, that sounds like, uh, you know, hell to me. Um, it may not be for the owner, but maybe down the line it will be because they're going to wonder why their business didn't work and why they're going through so many staff. It's because there has to be a connection between ownership that has the ultimate authority and developing an, a certain kind of empathy by being in the midst of the systems that we expect others to uh, live in. So you have to be present in the cafe to watch for bottlenecks, confusion, inconsistencies. You've got to be a present authority, as we say. So um, you don't always have to be there. After a year or so as an owner of a, a new shop, you can hire management. But really, you should always be connected to it and experiencing it and putting yourself in the place of, of the customer and the staff. Um, I wish that all coffee shop owners would 
not do have this trajectory where they spend a lot of time in their coffee bar, they get it going, and they're just like delegating a manager. And then finally, they just do all their work from their home on their laptop. And sometimes they visit the cafe just to see the cafe, I guess, to kind of, you know, parade through it. But really, they're not there long enough to pick up the nuance of what's actually happening. The way that the tables wobble, the way the bathroom smells, the the uncomfortable nature of the seats they chose. Um, if you did 90% of your work in the cafe indefinitely, if that was true for all owners, cafes that you experience right now would be so different because people that experience the things they create, create better experiences because they have a personal connection to it. That's the challenge here with systems and standards that we set. We've got to have connection to it or we create a disconnect that eventually brings back that negative white noise that brings back that that bad experience. So a little bit of a tangent there. So you have to observe, you have to be there. You have to take advantage of other people's observations too. Ask for feedback, but just don't stop one, with one ask. You know, ask many times. Make it a feedback culture. Ask other people about what's happening in the coffee shop. And by your own observations and observations of others, you're creating an overall picture of what's actually happening. And you're digging deeper into investigate what's actually happening before you make a decision on prescribing a system. Um, you need to investigate actually root causes and symptoms and all that stuff. So observation is the first step in creating a, a good system that actually solves a problem and keeps it solved. The next thing is after you've got a list of systems that you you know notice that need to be created is prioritizing because you could have a, a list a mile long of different kinds of SOPs and processes and whatnot that needs to be put in place in your shop but um, you might not have the time and bandwidth to be able to focus on all of them. Uh, and that's most of us, really. So here's how you prioritize. You prioritize the creation of systems based on customer impact, high frequency, and urgency. What that means is that anything that the customer comes in contact with at a high rate of frequency throughout the cafe is a priority. So the condiment bars, the bathrooms, the seating area, the way you present and the cleanliness of your bar at the POS, um, things like that. Just think about the sensory journey of a customer in your cafe, and you've got kind of a prioritized list right there. There are other things that you have to focus on, of course, like uh, things that are urgent, and they might be problems that arise from customer complaints or things that are broken there has to be an addressing of those issues and a system might help in and having a process or a standard written down clearly for that would help in uh, solving that urgent problem. Otherwise, I'd say prioritization has to be based on what the customer uses or comes in contact with on a frequent basis. That's a great way to start prioritizing. Another element of prioritizing is to think about choosing which one of those uh, systems or standards you want to use to highlight the way you want everyone to approach every system. So there's lots of systems in the coffee shop. I tend to focus when I'm thinking about how to influence culture and the approach to uh, lists and stuff in terms of cleaning. So if I really focus on driving home the idea that cleaning is uh, so important and it has to be thorough. It's not just about wiping things down. It's, it's about truly cleaning them and, and making it look and be great. Then that kind of detail-oriented philosophy that is driven home in that one area will kind of cross over into other ways that people behave. The way they stand at the register, the way that they clean bathrooms, how they stock cups. It's just one system that will influence how people uh, you know, approach other systems. And the reason why this is important is because if you just try to do all of the systems, it will get watered down. If you had to start with just one or two, pick the ones where you can really drive home the point of how you want people to approach the work in a mindful and thorough and detail-oriented way. So now, after we've prioritized this list of systems, the next thing that we want to do is write them. When we're writing systems, 
Uh, we have to envision the ideal, but you have to be realistic. Closers know that this is something we don't practice very often because closers' checklists can sometimes be written uh, in such a way that we think these are superhuman people, but they are not. They're just people like you and me, and uh, we have to be realistic. Again, back to observing and being present. You won't write something unrealistic if you yourself know what it's like to work in the space. So that's the first thing. Envision the ideal outcome, but also balance that with realistic uh, expectations that are just things you observe. Like there's only so much time for somebody to do these things. How are you going to uh, hold them accountable for something that's impossible, right? Another thing that you have to focus on when you're writing an SOP, a checklist, a process, or a system is to be as detailed as possible, but use, but use simple language. A step-by-step -step format is great for this. You have bullet points, one, two, three, four, five, all of that stuff. Um, it might seem like a lot, but it's actually something that people will internalize. We have a lot of capacity in our brains to hold information. This is why bartenders can memorize so many different recipes of cocktails over time, and they may be complicated in their steps, but you absorb that information. So this is our opportunity to, to get people to absorb good, detailed, oriented information so that we don't have to come back and say, well, why are you doing it this way? And realize that we forgot that we actually didn't write that down. And yeah, you can say, well, people should know, uh, you know, whenever you hear should, I don't think that you're in a good place mentally. Yeah, people should, that's debatable, but they don't and they won't. And you have to assume that they won't. You have to put it down in writing as detailed as possible, not in a sneery kind of, you know, infantilizing way, but in a way that recognizes the reality that when you've got lots of things to focus on, you're not always going to give it your cognitive best and you need some help. Again, systems are servants of people and this system has to help people be that detail-oriented person that they want to be in their work. Because everyone wants to do a good job. It's just sometimes we need assistance, and that's what these are for. So give the instructions in detail um, and communicate what you want from this, even down to like how to hold the broom, how to wipe the table down, step by step. And then get feedback from your staff in the process of writing. If you've got a draft of an SOP or a process, submit it to your staff and see what they think. They might have some input and say, well, you wrote this down here, but we actually don't have that tool anymore. Or um, this doesn't seem realistic because at this time of the day, we've got this rush of customers and then both of us will be at different places in the cafe. Oh, I didn't know that. Now we're going to change where this goes and that goes. It's important to get feedback, not just because of that, which is huge, but also because that is the beginning of buy-in from staff when they've had a part in creating it and you're giving them uh, a preview of something that they're going to be living by. That shows respect to them. Lastly, you have to make sure that you're not asking them to do anything illegal or against health code or OSHA. You know, so if you ask people to go and, you know, get that special uh, milk crate that we all stand on to put the cups up at the top shelf in the uh, closet, if that's in your SOP, um, it's institutionalized that we should be using a milk crate to stand on. I don't know, maybe you should get a step stool. That's probably better, you know, want to institute unsafe practices and encourage people that direction. You might get dinged for it. And uh, worse, you might just have somebody get hurt. So make sure you're considering that in the writing process. Now it is time to launch your uh, process. And the first step there is going to be to prepare your staff. Announce this in advance and collect the tools and communication and communicate this uh, coming change to a system through all channels. If you want people to start making ice lattes a particular way, you've got to have a process for that written down. You have to change the manual. You've got to communicate it in advance and have a date by which everyone should be making it. And you have to have the tools necessary. So if you want people to shake an iced beverage, don't just buy one shaker for the bar and expect them to use the milk rinser for every time they have a, a drink because, you know, realistically, you're probably going to want to buy five so that we can have a rotation. That's just planning, okay? When you rush things into existence, it doesn't take into consideration what it really looks like to do this thing. Preparation in advance allows you the time and allows them the time to prepare their minds, uh, the tools, and the processes. Next, there's the training. You have to actually get people to understand 
Uh, maybe it's something small that can be communicated through email, but if it's a new system for something that's big, you can invite everybody to a meeting really quickly to show them face-to-face what's going on, how to do it, let's practice it. Another way to do this is a manager can just have a checklist of all the people that uh, they're responsible for and make sure that they have a one-on-one with them about this new process so that they get actual face-to-face communication with them and know that they understand exactly what that process is all about. And then the day comes that you launch it, everyone is prepared, you've got the tools, it feels good, you are part of the process of writing it and feedback. We're not just surprising people with new stuff that's just out of left field. So we're already winning here. Next is the follow-up. You have to check back on the progress, see if people need clarity. Don't expect them to just immediately change the way that they've been doing things. Um, that, that's unrealistic. Expect that you're going to have to coach people through muscle memory change and all of that stuff. And give grace, you know, give grace to them in the process. And I guarantee they're going to respond well to that. Now, the final step here is about refinement. These are living documents. A system is a living document. It's a living part of your business, and it will change over time as your business changes. So again, back to the beginning here, we're observing what's happening. You focus your attention and your manager's attention and energies on observing systems in action. Schedule times to watch things happen. Don't just think you're going to pick up on the nuances and needs of your business by osmosis. This has to be planned. So take time to sit and watch, take notes, all that stuff. It is a huge part of refining a system. And again, you have to get feedback too. Ask people how it's going. Ask them what could be better. See it for yourself. Ask people, get the feedback. This is all is similar to how we originally determined that we needed a system. And this is the same way we actually refine a system. So now, if you find that something is needed, usually you're going to have to look at yourself first and say, well, how did I miscommunicate or set this up so that it wasn't clear? Next, you're going to look at the system and say, well, what about the system, right? Is the system insufficient? So maybe you have to adjust the system. Next, you can talk to the manager, see if maybe they communicated a different way than you asked them to. When you've gone through all these channels, starting at the highest level of authority, down through a system, down through the next level. Now you arrive at the staff, and sometimes you don't have staff that listen. Sometimes people just don't uh, you know, work out. It's not like staff have nothing to do with things that go wrong in the shop. You could have the most thorough treatment and graceful, empathetic, um, beautiful systems and relationships, but you could just have an ill-fitted employee in your midst that you know, either needs employee discipline or, or correction, extra coaching, or needs to be fired. You know, that obviously happens. We need to actually first think about ourselves though, as leaders and say, what did I do to facilitate this dysfunction? What did the system do to set people up or not set people up? Um, what about the management, etc.? And then when we are satisfied and we've actually gone through the process and not just immediately assumed that none of it, well, it's not us, it's not the system, it's not the manager, it's got to be them, we're going to fire them today. You have to go through the process to actually be curious and investigate. Firing somebody is a real serious thing. And in pinning the blame on an individual first is kind of a way that you waste a problem too, because you imagine that all of the problems are within this individual, it, rather than their environment or the system that they were given, Uh, So you have to go through that process because that employee may come and go, but the environment and the system is going to live way past them. So it really benefits the future of your business to think of this a little bit deeper than just making snap judgments about, you know, it's the staff's problem for not listening, et cetera. The refinement process is an opportunity to improve for the future of the business and the people that are working in the business now. Now, the last thing I'm going to say about refinement is that when you do make a change, you have to change it on all channels. If it's digital, paper, um, wherever information lives, where there's a standard communicated, you've got to change it. You can't just have varying standards floating out in space, you know, because somebody's going to find it and they're going to say, well, the pinned message on Slack says that we should make the ice lattes this way. 
oh, we forgot to change it, actually. Uh, we're making it a different way now. Well, well, who's to blame for that? It's easy to say, well, didn't you see other people making it different? Why didn't you ask me? Why didn't you ask for clarity? I hate that. I, you know, it's, it's, it's not about why didn't you ask for clarity. It's why didn't you give them clarity? Why didn't you change that in that system? You're not going to improve if you just ask, why didn't somebody, you know, ask for the thing that I should have given them? It doesn't, it doesn't the question doesn't make sense. So make sure you're making changes across the board in this refinement process when you do change something. Now, we've talked about a lot here. I have some final advice for you. If you are a new shop, you can launch with lots of systems in place, and you should. Um, you can go back through this episode and in other episodes that talk about SOPs and barista manuals and things like that, and put something together I think that'll work really well, um, and, and make sure it's contextually appropriate. But you're going to have to be flexible because your business is not yet open. You don't know the personality and needs of your business. And as the business flexes back and forth uh, with the coming and going of staff and customers and the rhythms of business, you're going to find the need to take those systems and adjust them and refine them. So that's for new shops. Existing shops, since you've already been open for a while, whether you have systems or not, Developing new systems or putting systems in place that, you know, you didn't have before, you should just choose a couple of things at a time and allow them to settle in for a few months. Get a lot of buy-in, go through these processes, and get into a rhythm of instituting these things where trust is created. You don't want to overwhelm people with, like, this 180-degree switch Overnight, we're going to do everything differently. That just never works. Operate with respect to the momentum and the turning radius of your business. The longer you've been in business, the bigger the turning radius is. So institute one or two things that are really high impact things that your business needs and let them settle in. The final two words I want you to remember here, relationships and grace. Systems are the servants of people and relationships. These do not replace face-to-face engagement. You have to be hands-on and present. And when you have intuitive systems for bolstering those things, they become very helpful tools instead of things that replace relationships, okay? And grace, because it's easy to be overbearing with these things. We could work so hard to create a system, and then we have to work hard to get people to, you know, work the system. And there's going to be frustration. We're going to find that there's resistance. And it's going to be hard to stay focused on being graceful in the process. But keep in mind the people and the complexities of human emotions and change that happens in the cafe. Is this safe? Is it not safe? You know, there's all the sorts of things going on in people's minds. If you stay the course and keep communication open, keep the face-to-face, and make this a collaborative and conversational process, I think you're going to find a lot of success in establishing systems in your business. So I hope that this was a helpful episode for you. This, among other things, is the kind of stuff I talk about at Coffee Fest, where I've been a presenter and judge for a very long time. Um, And I really hope that you take time to check Coffee Fest out because it really is one of the best trade shows to go to. I think it is the best event to go to if you want to be resourced well, um, equipped for success in specialty retail coffee. Um, The trade show floor has tons of vendors to help you see what's available out there to serve your customers. There's workshops, lectures, trainings, um, competitions, and a great community on top of that. So you can go to coffeefest.com to learn more. They're going to New York, Uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Seattle here in 2022. And you can get 50% off your registration fee when you go to coffeefest.com and register. Just use the code KEYS when you're registering. It gives you 50% off for any of the shows coming up this year in 2022. Hope to see you there. I'm going to be at most of these shows, and uh, it really is a great resource for you and your staff. Again, for more information, go visit coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode today. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join me. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, uh, follow us on Instagram, and share the show with a friend. I really love that you joined us here on the show today. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you 
keys to the shop.